Hi, welcome back to my eye. I'd like to continue with my comments that I've derived in my research of spiritual systems and how they relate to the statues of Easter Island, Indonesia, Turkey's Gobekli Tepe, and more. So, what do the golden calf, the statues of Easter Island, and Indonesia, and Turkey's Gobekli Tepe, all have in common? That is a good question. To involve the golden calf, you must first understand the symbolism of the golden calf. Kabbalistically, the golden calf represents a seed level in interpretation. Seed level interpretations in Kabbalah are very significant. Let's break it down. Kabbalistically, a seed level refers to a start of a consciousness, an idea, perhaps a desire. In the case of the golden calf, it represented doubt. Remember the Ten Commandments? You shall have no other gods before me, and you shall not make yourself a carved image. The First and Second Commandments go hand in hand, emphasizing the need for worship exclusively to the one true God. The Israelites violated this commandment and crafted their own graven image, the golden calf even before Moses came down from Mount Sinai. The significance of these carved images is that it changes the consciousness by casting doubt amongst the Israelites. This doubt can potentially grow, just like a seed. In essence, describing the golden calf is like describing a seed. A more concise analogy of a seed in the Bible is the seed of a tree, namely the two trees in the Bible the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of life. These two trees are at the root of all consciousness. Keep in mind that these tree of life analogies are part of every spiritual and religious discipline in the world, including Native North Americans. Kabbalistically, when your seed level of consciousness connects only to the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the physical world, you are living in the world of karma, doing the best that you can without realizing the true consequences of your actions. You mix the good with the bad, and you try to make sense of it. A tree of life connection in the physical world is your direct connection with the divine. Kabbalistically, this connection allows you to understand the seed level of this tree so as to understand the causes of all your actions, good or bad. It is an original seed of consciousness, and when nurtured properly, allows you to sow your own seeds of consciousness to affect and control the outcomes and actions of your own life. That is why the Kabbalistic Tree of Life is also called the language of branches. This language, when deciphered, allows you to understand all thoughts and actions beyond the literal, beyond intellect, giving you access to an emotional language which is at the root level of all outcomes. You must remember that when you plant seeds of consciousness, they will manifest in the physical world. But, depending on how the seeds take purchase, they will manifest in the world of karma or have a tree of life connection. If it is a tree of life connection, it will reveal the causal and the root level of reality from the upper world. There is nothing in this world of action that isn't the direct result from a force from the upper world. Now, how does the golden calf and the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life fit in with Easter Island and Indonesia and Gobekli Tepe statues? It all boils down to the seed level. The seed level of civilization. We all want to know what started it all. Who started it? Why? Were there individual gods? Ancient aliens? 
Were there gods who walked across oceans and taught civilizations? Or maybe, just maybe, it could be consistent with the idea of unity. One God, Einsaf, Elohim, the infinite. Many researchers suggest that there must have been some outside influence teaching advanced masonry knowledge to humanity. This notion, this idea, begs the question, was knowledge enough? What good is giving someone knowledge without giving him or her a reason to use it? That brings us to the idea of purpose. The gods did not appear just to deliver us knowledge. They appeared to deliver us purpose. They appeared to allow a group of people to transform themselves, to change. This purpose was through veneration. Knowledge guided this change. They made statues of God in the images of God, and they used a king to facilitate this change as well. They had a monarchy. This is consistent with Kabbalistic principles. Monarchies were prevalent at the time because the king was considered the leader, the one with the highest level of consciousness. The king possessed the dominant consciousness, and to those who were subjugated, they were subject to the king's judgment. It was the king's responsibility for his society to grow. Ultimately, he was judged on how he treated his subjects as a whole, while he served as king. All you have to do is look at ancient Egypt, in the Valley of the Kings, where many of the kings of ancient Egypt were buried. They had fancy and elaborate tombs, which gave evidence to this, through depicting an elaborate system of judgment. It was all about judgment. Favorable judgment allowed the king to become a star in the afterlife. They had a star system. In ancient Egypt, prior to Moses freeing the Israelites from slavery, they had a religious and spiritual system in place. They had their own truth. But was it their truth? Or was it the same truth? Unity, one infinite, one God? I believe it was. Moses introduced a new aspect, a new path to the divine, a path available to everyone, without a king, without a monarchy, a source of individual power. How was this achieved? By using the number 12, the number 7, the number 32, the number 10. All these numerological relationships were and are evident all around the world. They formed the building blocks for transformative societies. The key here is transformation. Spiritual transformation is at the forefront of all spiritual systems. Now, let us first look at the ancient Kabbalistic text, namely the Holy Zohar. It is the primary source of spiritual guidance and is said to be created over 2,000 years ago and was written to be used for the time we are in now. It speaks in the present, but of interest is how it was created. The authors of the Zohar knew that the process of change required two conditions, the maturity of the soul and the right moment. It was written by Rabbi Akiva, who is said to have achieved the highest level of spiritualism, greater than the likes of Abraham and Isaac. Rabbi Akiva, along with nine of his students, wrote the text. These ten men possessed inner qualities that precisely matched the qualities of the natural system of nature. The number ten was used. There was, and is, a direct correlation between the ten spiritual dimensions and the physical world. This text was written for transformative change, no less than we saw in the Ten Plagues of Egypt and when the Ten Commandments were created. Each aspect of nature requires an individual change in order to manifest a total change. Spiritually, this is viewed as a correction. In the Hindu religion, they have their own equivalent seven chakras. Kabbalistically, 
The lower seven dimensions can be seen as representing the human body. The crown, which is the head, both arms, both legs, the human reproductive organ, and the recipient. These seven Kabbalistic chakras can also be viewed as an archetype of the human body in terms of connecting to the divine consciousness. They are depicted as representing flow by the right arm, limit by the left arm, beauty by the crown, which is the head, perseverance by the right leg, focus by the left leg, and then connection, which are the genitals. Then we have the recipient, which is the receiver in the world of action. This Kabbalistic representation is the model for the flow of all energy, all consciousness, from the upper world to our world of action. We must remember that if this is law, it has been and is omnipresent within our existence. Now, if we go back to our Easter Island statues and compare them with the statues from Indonesia and Turkey's Gobekli Tepe, we see that there are similarities in design. In particular, the statue from Indonesia has an erect male reproductive organ. It can imply that a connection to a recipient was made. Who made the request? Perhaps people like you and me. Even Graham Hancock, when referring to the gods in the book of Genesis, asked, who were these people? But if we take the position that these people were like you and me, then what made these people different was the knowledge they possessed to summon the divine. They knew the system. They knew the combination of the number seven. They knew that they could advance themselves by using the formula to receive. It might have included individual tasks that culminated into one common goal, one common request. That request could have been to venerate the divine. They would have been given all the consciousness needed to accomplish that task, that group task. Could this be what the seven statues of Easter Island represent? The seven statues, which are also referred to as the seven brothers? Are these seven statues represented in the seven chakras and in the seven spiritual dimensions of Judaic mysticism? Did these seven brothers constitute a formula for selecting a leader? A recipient? A king? And more importantly, was the same formula used in Indonesia and in Turkey's Gobekli Tepe? To me, the evidence is overwhelming. The statues bear the same features, and the local architecture bears the same masonry styles. This is an alternate way of looking at these mysteries. But if more attention was paid to the relationships with numbers and with spiritual systems, it may lead to a more concise explanation as to the creation of these mysterious megaliths. Even Graham Hancock states, I don't believe that consciousness is generated by the brain. This consciousness, this knowledge, is omnipresent. What is utterly lost is the path to its abundance. This is our amnesia. This is what many scholars and writers claim that our global society is stricken with. I hope you've enjoyed this video of my eye, and I urge you to become part of this journey of discovery and truth. Please support me and my eye by hitting the like, subscribe, and share buttons. Remember, by hitting the bell notifications, you can be notified of our future videos. If you'd like to investigate the principles that we've presented in this video further, please purchase a copy of my book, Inside the Queen's Chamber. It's available in English and Spanish. You can also support us through our Patreon page. All the links are listed below. And remember, we do look forward to your comments, but more importantly, your questions. Thanks.